A Turing machine is supposed to be able to manipulate symbols on a theoretical strip of tape. In most classes teaching automata theory, people only work with one-way automata. But, like in real machines that read tape, we can go backwards. For transducers, this allows for additional computational power that can implement a wider range of algorithms. Here, I'll show you what two-way finite-state automata and transducers are, and how they can do this. A two-way automaton is mostly the same as a one-way automaton. The differences are the addition of edge markers and in how transitions are defined. So we can define a two-way automaton as a set of symbols that includes the input alphabet and a left and right edge marker, a set of states, an initial state, a set of final states, and a transition function that maps a state symbol pair to not only another state, but also a direction, which we'll represent with plus for forward and minus for backward. Now let's say we want an automaton that accepts a string if and only if the second to last letter is A. We'll have a set of states Q0 through Q4. The symbols will be A, B, and the edge markers. Q0 is a start state, and Q4 is the final state. I'll list the transitions as we traverse through the string. We'll use the example string B, A, 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 B. Since we're using edge markers, we need to add them to the string before giving it to the automaton. We're starting from the left marker instead of the first letter. What we're going to do is read until the end and then look two characters backwards. So when we read this left edge marker, we're going to transition to the same state and explicitly mark that we're moving forward in the string. When we read an A or B in this state, we're going to do the same thing. This is because we don't care about the symbols until we start counting back from the end. So we keep transitioning to state Q0 until we read the right edge marker. When we do, we're going to transition to a new state. This transition also indicates that we're going to go backwards, so the next character we're reading is the last B. From here, finishing the automaton is just like checking if the second letter is A in a one-way automaton, but with the indication of backwards movement. We transition to another state regardless of the letter. Then, we transition to the accepting state if the next letter, which is the second from the end, is A, or to another non-accepting state if it's B. That's it. Now this automaton actually has one more state than the smallest equivalent one-way deterministic automaton, but if we want to go further back, third, fourth, fifth letter from the end, then for each additional letter, we add one more counting state after Q1. Going back further in a one-way automaton, requires an exponentially larger number of states. So even though they're equivalent in computational power, two-way automata can make things a lot simpler. Two-way transducers are more powerful, as they're able to perform certain operations of arbitrary length, like copying and reversing. Here's a transducer that copies the input string of A's and B's. Let's see how it copies ABA to output ABAABA. In the starting state, we read the left edge marker. We move forward in the input string and output nothing. In the second state, we read A's and B's. When we do, we move forward and output the symbol we just read. We do this for ABA and output ABA. Then we read the right edge. When we do this, we go backwards in the input string and output nothing. In this next state, we again loop through the A's and B's, but backwards and without outputting anything. This essentially rewinds the tape. When we read the left edge marker, we start moving forward again. Like in state Q1, we loop through the input and output the letters we just read. We're left with ABA, ABA, and that's how we can take advantage of two-way transducers, because this can't be done with a one-way machine. If you found this video helpful, feel free to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.